This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 420 was produced on March 21st, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. Saxo Bank's Commodities Chief Ola Hansen returns as this week's feature interview guest. Ola sees green shoots across the commodity sector. We'll discuss which commodities are hot and which are not, and what's driving the rally, from softs to ags to metals to energy. I have a special announcement for our Australian listeners this week. As you already know, nuclear energy is suddenly center stage in Australian political debate, with the sitting government holding fast to its anti-nuclear policies, while the opposition party is adopting a pro-nuclear stance as part of its campaign platform leading up to the 2025 federal elections. But neither side seems well informed on the latest nuclear technology developments in this debate. So I've been invited to give a talk on that subject on Wednesday evening, April 10th, at the Royal Automobile Club of Australia in the Sydney CBD. The title of my presentation will be Advanced Nuclear Energy, Secrets the Media and Politicians Haven't Told You. Early bird tickets to attend are 40 Australian dollars, which goes to cover the cost of the room and AV equipment. There will also be a cash bar available. Now, the ticket price is going up after the early bird inventory sells out, so move fast if you want tickets. This event is sponsored by Stratcon and Freelancer.com, and all proceeds will be donated to the Royal Automobile Club. This event is being promoted in Australia on several big mailing lists, and tickets are expected to sell out quickly. So if you'd like to attend, please use the link you'll find in your Research Roundup email to register, or just go to startcon.com forward slash nuclear. That's S-T-A-R-T-C-O-N, like Start Conference dot com slash nuclear. The event organizers have a small number of free tickets reserved for Australian government officials and members of the press. If you or someone you know qualifies in that regard, reach out to the event organizers via email to nuclear at startcon.com. I look forward to meeting some of you in Sydney on April 10th. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, March 21st, 2024. The S&P 500 June futures were up 103 basis points, trading at 52.86. The bull trend continues in the post-FOMC. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index up 56 basis points, trading at 103.37. The May WTI crude oil contract up 248 basis points, trading at 81.27. Oil bullishly broke out, but the big question now is how much bullish follow-through will there be? We'll take a look at that chart in the postgame, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The May Arbob gasoline up 264 basis points, closing at 272. The gasoline has been very strong, but approaching the resistance of the 2023 highs. The April gold contract up 37 basis points to 21.89. A bullish breakout in the post-FOMC. Will the bulls make it stick? Copper down 25 basis points to 405. Uranium up 650 basis points to 88.50. Uranium put in a swing low, but will we see bullish breakouts in the weeks to come? The U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up 8 basis points, trading at 427. The key news to watch next week will be the final GDP, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment, and the core PCE price index. This week's feature interview guest is Saxo Bank's Commodities Chief, Ole Hansen. Eric, why did we get Ole back on the show this week? Patrick, Ola Hansen has been around the commodity sector for his entire career. He's one of the most respected guys in the business, and I always enjoy our interviews. He's one of my favorite guests in the commodity space. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Eric's interview with Ole Hansen is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. 
Joining me now is Ola Hansen, head of commodity strategy for Saxo Bank. Ola prepared a slide deck to accompany today's interview with some terrific graphs and charts. So you'll want to download that. You'll find the download link in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says looking for the downloads above Ola's picture. Ola, it's great to have you back on the show. The title of the slide deck is Commodity Outlook for 2024. Last time we had you on, you said you thought maybe commodities were bottoming and starting to turn around. How are things looking? Thank you very much, Eric, for for inviting me back. Well, um, yeah, it's we have been uh, bottoming it out now for for the best part of a year, and this is really um, uh, quite an interesting time that we 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 speak again because uh, I think if we look at some of the developments that have been seen across commodities uh, so far this month. Uh, we, we're seeing some green shoots starting to emerge, not only the the precious metals, which uh, really kicked off the rally at the start of the month. We're also seeing uh, just recently some strengths coming back into industrial metals. The energy sector is is after a prolonged period of sideways trading, showing signs as well of wanting at least to try to uh, to move higher. So we're basically re- asking the question whether this is this is it for the correction. And uh, from a technical perspective, it seems like we are starting to break that downtrend that has been in place since uh, the peak back in 2022. Let's go ahead and dive into the slide deck starting on page two. We're seeing what looks like the beginning of a breakout on this, uh, or break above the trend line, I should say, on uh, this chart. What's the chart and what's it telling us? Well, simply that some of the strengths that we have seen uh, in some of the sectors is now becoming a bit more broad. Um, I'm sure we all have seen the all the headlines about our Coke chocolate bars getting more expensive. We talk about that in a, in a second, uh, but also the the move we've seen uh, somewhat perplexing a lot of traders uh, in gold recently. How it just uh, moved higher without really having any strong catalyst, and now just recently um, also the tightness that's starting to emerge in, in the copper market is is uh, helping uh, ascending prices higher and, and also starting to sway investors and, and speculators back into into the market because some of the many of these markets have been trading really with a almost a neutral bias for quite a long time simply because we haven't had any momentum in the market so momentum is what is needed right now in order for for some of these moves to uh, to stick uh, because they will attract uh, fresh fresh demand from from funds who have been been sidelines for for a while here Looking at page three and your chart of all of the commodities, obviously cocoa will come to that story in just a minute, but it seems like for the most part, uh, everything is starting to look up. Not not everything, I should say. Uh, is there a trend here in terms of, of what we should understand from a macro perspective? Is this inflation driven? Is this driving inflation? Is it energy driven? Is it metals driven? What's what's the backstory here? Well, I think it's a combination of, of several things. There's no doubt that the, the, the headwinds that we've seen uh, since, well, for the last year and a bit, a uh, year and a half almost, has been the rapid uh, rise in interest rates. It's re- been lifting funding costs for many industries. It's led uh, to a uh, destocking of uh, inventory levels, especially in, the, in metals, but also other commodities. And that has been weighing on, on prices. And now we're seeing some of the, uh, and, and producers starting to respond to some of these uh, developments. Not only are we we're seeing uh, production uh, starting to be reduced in certain areas just in order to uh, balance the market. That's uh, underpinning prices. So basically saying that uh, it's not only a question about demand, but supply obviously can be adjusted as well. And we're seeing some of that starting to emerge uh, in a place like natural gas. But then also the, the prospect for, for rate cuts, even though they have been, been lowered quite significantly in, in the last couple of months due to the continued data strength from the US and, and, and sticky inflation, then the market is is looking to uh, to price in a an environment where where funding costs starts to come down. So um, that's having an impact. And then the, the leftover from last year and with the with the weather developments, where we can only see we've had a north south divide. The northern hemisphere harvest season last year was very good. That basically led to a, a big increase in uh, or robust increase in key crops: corn, wheat, and soybeans. Whereas the southern hemisphere struggled with weather uh, developments and uh, uh, leading to very high prices in, in some like coffee, cotton, uh, sugar, and then, of course, uh, some like cocoa. Let's go ahead and take a look at cocoa on uh, page four in the slide deck. Holy cow, we're, we've seen the price of cocoa, what, uh, double almost just in the last couple of months and more than triple in the last year. Uh, what's the, the fundamental driver here? What happened? Simply supply. The cocoa we have to re- remember is is dependent on on production from a very small part of the world, West Africa, Ghana, Ivory Coast. Whether there has been dismal in in the last few months, first too wet and then too too hot, 
we have uh, aging trees uh, struggling uh, to uh, produce. Uh, that they basically means they need fertilizers and pesticides. The farmers are not reaping the benefits from from these higher prices because uh, farm lots are very small. So they are the price they can sell at is dictated by the government um, or by the the exporters. So so the normally when you have a very high price, you'll also have higher production. But this this function is not working in cocoa, and uh, this has led to a lot of head scratching. Um, many of the big chocolate producers around the world they buy the cocoa in the, in the forward market, so, so also in the futures market. And what we've actually seen uh, during the latest run-up in prices, it has not been speculative-driven. Speculative has been net-selling cocoa futures for the past two months. Instead, the buying has come from from producers covering their shorts position, basically covering their hedges against cocoa, the beans they thought they bought, but uh, which they're suddenly not going to get because of the production is down by close to one-third. And this is just the late, leading to this massive scramble for, for supplies, which is driving up the futures price, and you can see on the on the on the chart that is primarily the, the front end. So the uh, the current front contract, the May twenty four contract, is screaming above eight thousand dollars. The next year, May two thousand twenty five, is still stuck around five thousand. So that basically leaves us with a massive backwardation of thirty five percent. And that and it just highlights a market which, in at least for the coming months, will be struggling. And um, it's leading to another round of, of shrinkflation where producers of your chocolate bars will try to uh, maintain revenues by cutting the size of the package. Uh, so basically they reduce the, the amount of cocoa they need to produce the bar while keeping the price at the same level. So um, we're, we're most certainly going to see quite a bit of that in the coming months. Now, normally when I see a commodity move this far on a weather-related phenomenon, the, the trade there is actually to fade it, to bet the other way. But of course, when we're short, we like to be selling into contango rather than backwardation. So you really, if you try to short this market on a, on a forward basis in next year's contract, you're giving up about a third of that price in terms of where you're in or you're short. Is it a ripe short? Is that why everybody has been selling cocoa futures or is it too early for that? What, what do you, is there a trading opportunity? Opportunity here, considering that the, the May twenty five has uh, remained steady around uh, five thousand here for while well, the the front has been raising high, could it obviously indicate that it, it's found a bit of a plateau where the market is, and it makes sense because this is uh, the May twenty five is the next season because the the current season is, is more or less done and it, it looks horrible. The mid season, which starts in around April, it looks equally bad. So it's, it's, we're not going to have a, much of a catch up in terms of additional supplies coming from that mid-season crop. Then the focus will be turning to to next year's crop. And then the expectations are obviously that at least the farmers will get a higher price than, than what they received this year. And that will help them fund the need for for, for the, the different pesticides and fertilizers and so on that's required for these trees to to deliver a decent production. So, um, so with that in mind, it probably makes sense, but actually selling it with the conditions we've had this year, I think there's probably a risk to that. So it's it's a tricky trade, uh, Eric, and and we're also seeing as as uh, as I mentioned, uh, hedge funds have actually been pulling back, uh, getting out of longs, even though the price continues to go up because it, this is a market which is just in a flux right now, where it's almost goes a thousand dollars within a matter of days, and that that's an extremely tricky one to call a top on. Let's move on to page five and agricultural futures. Uh, What is going on here with the food story? And particularly, what is it going to mean from a macro standpoint? If we continue to see a lot of these food prices moving higher, this is not exactly an economic environment where consumers can afford higher food prices. What could the consequences be? We touched a little bit uh, on it earlier, but uh, I think, first of all, we, we have to say, thank God, this is not in the reverse, that we are seeing these very, very strong gains uh, occurring to uh, key crops like corn, uh, wheat, and soybeans, because then obviously we would have a, we could be talking about a food crisis uh, if, if uh, suddenly we had wheat prices up uh, 200% uh, in, instead of cocoa. So um, right now, it, this is the, the, the north-south uh, divide, as, as I talked about, uh, soft commodities are, are they're not strictly necessary for us to live. Uh, I suppose uh, many would say a life without coffee would be uh, not a life worth living. I'm, I'm probably uh, part of that group. Uh, chocolate bars are a little bit more um, sanguine on that on that one, but it, it just highlights how weather become more volatile and how we, uh, at least for the past six months or so, have seen this quite big divergence uh, following a period where both sectors were more or less in in, in lockstep falling at the same rate. But uh, since then, the weather developments, uh, uh, different develop- weather developments has, has occurred and, and to, to bring this big changes in, in or the divergence between grains and softs. And, and as I mentioned, 
If you look at the weekly cut report, the, the short position, uh, it was reduced a bit uh, in the last week, reporting week, but the short position just recently hit a record record high in, in uh, if you look at uh, corn, wheat and soybeans combined. And, and this is now in the lull period before we're going with the Northern Hemisphere season. And, and again, do you really want to be a record short uh, when you have uh, potentially some uncertainties uh, starting to uh, potentially unfolding in, in the months ahead? Moving on to page six and natural gas. Boy, the winter of 2022-2023 was a huge bearish story in natural gas, just crashing prices. It seems like for the last year or so, we've stabilized. I don't know if this is a bottoming pattern. Are we about to go the other direction and, and move up on natural gas prices? I think we are. And simply for the reason... Several reasons, but uh, as a right there in the headline, the old saying, the best, uh, just like cocoa, the, uh, where we have high prices, low prices, needed to cure low prices. And I think we're seeing part of that medicine being applied right now with uh, EQT and Tiro Comstock and Chesapeake recently announcing production cuts, simply because the inventory levels right now, in, as you can see in the top middle chart there, we, we got inventory levels around 35% above the five-year average. So that very big overhang of, of uh, stocks in underground storage ahead of the rebuilding it starts very soon. That needs to be uh, brought in back into line in order to uh, support price. And I think we've seen the first step for that to uh, to happen. And then we also uh, see the continued expansion of uh, U.S. export capabilities for LNG. They will also continue to uh, to attract or, or remove gas out of the country to the rest of the world and uh, thereby also underpinning prices, which remains extremely cheap relative to the rest of the world. So a massive competitive advantage for U.S. Uh, consumers of natural gas compared to the rest of the world. So I think we are, the one and a half uh, dollar level is, it looks like it's, it's something, it's, it's a level that, that's just like OPEC Plus is defending 70 in Brent. I think we, uh, one and a half is potentially a level that, that will increasingly be defended by producers uh, simply by cutting production. Ola, after the Ukraine conflict broke out in the summer of 2022, U.S. natural gas prices topped $10 as there was sudden demand to send a lot of U.S. gas to Europe in order to help them out and so forth. We're down more than 80% now, below $2 from $10. It seems to me like things are really heating up geopolitically. But at the same time, I think the fundamentals are different in terms of Europe's vulnerability. So the question on my mind as I think about a speculative long trade in natural gas is how vulnerable is Europe at this point uh, if there is a military disruption of some kind due to the escalating geopolitical tension around Gaza and the, the Red Sea and so forth. Do we have the same kind of vulnerability? Is there a risk of another moonshot to $10? I think the... The answer to that is no. Also, part of the, the reason that the, the, we rallied as forcefully as we did back then is similar stories to what we just recently seen in, in cocoa, where producers or buyers of cocoa have been hedging cocoa by going short the futures market. Utilities in Europe had been selling gas ahead of the, the spike simply because we were heading towards some sort of an economic slowdown. They had fixed term contracts with Gazprom to receive a certain amount of gas. As they could see, they were not going to need that gas. They sold that gas forward in the futures market. Suddenly, Gazprom turned off the taps. They were left with a short that uh, was not going to be covered by gas coming in, and they had to cover the short, and that really set the ball rolling, and that's why we had these massive spikes back then in, in European gas prices, where I believe really it was 100, 350 euros per megawatt hour, where we're now trading below 30. So that will not re- be repeated. We are building up. LNG uh, import facilities, and, and a lot of that is coming from the U.S. We have adjusted to longer uh, sailing routes uh, south of uh, Africa instead of the uh, through the Red Sea. So I think that's also a development we should not be too worried about. But the worry is probably still supplies from Russia, because even though pipeline gas has been reduced significantly, there's only a, a couple of lines left open, selling gas to more Russia-friendly nations in southern Europe. But we've also seen uh, LNG, uh, LNG from Russia actually picking up. And uh, there's been recent some initiatives trying to curb that sale. So if, if that is successfully implemented, uh, I doubt it at this point in time, um, then it potentially could tighten the market. But overall, we, we've, been, uh, we've been lucky once again this, uh, this winter with another very mild winter. Economic activity has been on the, on the weak side. We, uh, we're entering this common season with, with inventory levels at, at high levels, which should be uh, relatively uh, manageable to, uh, to get it back up to uh, decent levels by the time winter starts again. And we can already see now winter prices are trading uh, relatively cheap, both uh, for the coming winter and next winter again. So the market is, is taking quite a sanguine uh, view on, on the current developments. 
Ola, something we've talked about before in your previous interviews I'd like to come back to, which is backwardation versus contango, and particularly why for people who are speculating on the long side of commodities, backwardation is your friend. We've discussed this before, but I'd like to go through it again just to make sure it's clear, because even among professional traders outside the commodities community specifically, this concept is not well understood. No, exactly. And it created quite a few gray hairs and we can, we'll, we'll look at that on the following slide. But yeah, the backwardation is, is really, a, in essence, a sign of market being tight. So if you are in need of supplies, you are prepared to pay up to get immediate delivery. And that basically means the spot price uh, is the highest along the whole curve. So further out you go, the, the, the prices tend to drop off. And the opposite is contango. Normally, what you would have most markets trading in if everything was equal and and you're only looking at what is the funding cost of holding a a commodity position then commodities should be trading in contango because we have higher interest rates we have funding costs and that basically means and any if you disregard supply and demand uh, storage and so on then all commodities should really uh, a year out in the future should be trading at uh, at a five percent discount at a contango that's simply the cost of of financing uh, or the treasury bill for 12 months so in theory everything that trades in backwardation is is showing strength because not only is it mitigating the uh, uh, offsetting the, the cost of, of holding position or funding a position, it also shows how the market is tight. And how does that matter for an investor? It does simply because whether you are in a futures uh, market or you're in an ETF or a swap or whatever, all these uh, positions are hedged back into the futures market. This is the purest form of trading commodities. And if you have a long position and you're in backwardation, every month the, the roll takes place. You're selling an expiring contract at a higher price than where you buy the next. So that is giving you a positive roll yield. And that over time, that uh, all these small roll yields, that accumulates. And that's why you, when you look at commodity indices, indices, you have to look at the total return because the total return takes these rolls either positive or negative into account. Vice versa, contango, opposite. You're selling an expiring contract at a lower price than where you're buying the next. That's penalizing you on a, your return over time. And, and, and that's why something like natural gas has been so incredibly difficult to trade from a long perspective, unless you have a very short-term time horizon, because the contango has been quite intrinsic for a long time and basically mean that you've been eroding your, your investment slowly over time and um, basically making it, it very, expensive, very expensive to have a long-term view on the market. But... Turning to page eight, we could just simply see the impact of the backwardation versus contango because we came up until the pandemic in 2020. We'd gone through a number of years where the commodity sector was fairly boring, supply was ample, and uh, the markets, most markets were trading at contango. That basically means in the five year period from 2016 up until the end of 2020, that does include also the, the early parts of, of the uh, the post pandemic rally. But during that period of time, if you look at your your spot prices, you would have thought an investment, an ETF investment in the Bloomberg Commodity Index would have given you a forty seven percent return. But when you look at your actual account statement, you only made six percent, simply because Contango was just was costing you money on a on a monthly basis during that time. Fast forward to the last uh, nearly five years, it's what are we up to uh, four year and a bit. Since early 2021, where most commodities have been trading in backwardation, similar to the tightness that occurred after the uh, the post-pandemic spike in demand uh, for, for raw materials and the all the government support for, for economic growth, we're seeing during this time that the spot price has been trading as it's up 21%, but your actual return, have you held an ETF or held a swap tracking this, uh, this index, you would have made 37%. So it is a major, major mover, um, and it, it is one that... This backwardation in the last couple of years has also slowly started to attract new investors, um, asset managers and so on into the commodity space. But what we need right now is uh, clarity about the economic outlook for growth. We need clarity about the direction of interest rates before I think we see the paper, so-called paper demand for commodities uh, picking up in earnest. Well, moving on to page nine, let's talk about U.S. rate cuts, what they mean. Particularly, you've got the chart here of SOFR futures. Uh, as SOFR, of course, is secured overnight financing rate. Once you know what it stands for, I don't think you're any closer to understanding what it actually means. So maybe you can explain that as well. The SOFR rates uh, is a, the, the way the market can bet on future, uh, on the direction of short-term rates. The ones I just uh, highlighted here is is literally the, the price 
will more or less reflect the the Fed fund rate when when it comes to expiry, uh, give or take. So it, it's a good gauge for for where the market is is uh, pricing the rate cut expectation, and so for futures quite often are used when we have these calculations of uh, the percentage chance of a cut uh, in July is so and so and, and all these chains. Quite often it's the SOFA futures that makes up this calculation. And what we have seen is since the, uh, the the start of the year where we really started on a, on a high note in terms of expectations, we were looking for uh, almost seven rate cuts in 2024. That uh, expectation has deflated quite significantly and now we're looking at around three and we can see the cuts has been moved further and further out and uh, it does make sense. The market is, is uh, scratching the head a bit simply because inflation has come down, but the short-term momentum indicators uh, looking at the three months change on an, on an annual basis and six months change as well in the core deflation, they have both uh, started to uh, to pick up after they actually for, for a couple of months were hovering around that 2% inflation target. So the question is really, will they cut? Uh, I believe they will. But how much will it be dependent on, on the direction of inflation? Will they start to look at other, other issues uh, more, than, more than inflation, which potentially could end up being more sticky than, than originally thought? That is really the, the uncertainty that we have in, this, this, uh, in the volatility right now in, in the bond markets and in these short-term rates. Higher interest rates tend to lead to a sharper contango or less backwardation. What else do we need to know about changing interest rates and how they affect commodity markets? Simply because it's the cost of money, and if the money or cost of money comes down, then they should obviously support economic activity. It should also support the companies who have been uh, bringing down their inventory, the stock levels of, of uh, key commodities, for in in order to uh, bring down their funding costs, especially last year. And uh, that's the so-called restocking uh, cycle, which we which we look towards as as adding some additional physical demand to the market, not only the the paper demand, which is through the futures and uh, which can be carried out by asset managers and, and so on and hedge fund CTAs, but also actual real demand from from end users uh, restocking simply because the cost of money starts to come down and making it more, more interesting again. But at the same time, it has to be coincided with the expectations that the economic the economic outlook has uh, has stabilized and we are we're looking for 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 higher growth in in the in the months ahead and yet the jury is probably still also out on that one especially in the US where some of the signs are still that the yes we are probably not going to see recession but at least the economic outlook uh, could show uh, some weakness but then at the same time other parts of the world are benefiting from lower funding costs and uh, potentially that also a weaker dollar Let's move on to slide 10 and a topic that's near and dear to many of our listeners' hearts, which is precious metals. Ola, I'm going to be the first to admit that I don't really understand this big bull move up that we've seen in the last month or so. Uh, it seems pretty darn clear that it was Fed Commissioner Waller's comments that the market interpreted in a way that was the catalyst for this big move. Uh, honestly, I don't understand. I heard what he said. I don't understand how that translates to, what was it, a $150 move in gold in a matter of a few days. Am I missing something? Is there a clear reason that I don't understand why this happened? I think we're all missing uh, something, and I think there's no clear explanation to uh, why it happened now. I think a lot of uh, commentators expected the move to happen, but not at a time where we just gone through a sharp reduction in the expectations for rates. We can see that there on slide 10. The, this is where the Fed funds is expected to be by either July and December. And you can see by July, we are we are now looking at just around one cut. And uh, by December, we're looking at less than three from uh, close to seven. And despite of this, the market has moved higher. I think there's probably a couple of things, and and the underlying physical demand, uh, we should not ignore. It's it's extremely strong, especially in, in in China, where where investors, the middle class in China, they are faced with a stock market which up until recently was uh, was struggling quite a bit. As tro- property market which is no longer a safe uh, place to put your retirement uh, money than it used to, and uh, they are looking with the limited amount of of investable products they have. Gold has become a, a, a hot topic. Central banks, we all know, have been continued to buy. There was, uh, I think, there's even recently some talk that Russia's uh, dollars should, that was held at the central banks around the world should be confiscated and used to put towards rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, I can't even f- imagine what kind of an impact that would have uh, for the global system if that was to be the case. But this just thought of that. I'm sure is 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 likely to uh, to have added some additional demand from from central banks getting out of the dollar. So that's one part, and I think we just have have to look at the card report uh, on the on the week the data. The demand through uh, the, the futures uh, demand has just exploded in the last two reporting weeks. Uh, hedge funds bought 250 tons of gold, 
And um, that's basically a quarter of what uh, all central banks bought in a whole year. And they bought that in two weeks. That is a massive amount of gold that is uh, adding to a squeeze in the price. So so I would say this move has been momentum, technical breakout driven. And that also means that for now, this rally is built on a bit of a shaky foundation. We all know hedge funds are not married to the position. I used to work for one. They will change the outlook if there is a change in the technical or the fundamental outlook. Uh, the fundamental outlook is has changed somewhat to a little bit towards the negative side, but the technical for now is, is holding up. So I'm, I would be cautious of calling this the this the new leg uh, higher. I think it's perhaps happened a bit too soon. It really all depends on whether we get any data that uh, adds some downward pressure on the price and then potentially forces the ball to roll. Because we have, what we have to remember, hedge funds, they will buy into strength and sell into weakness. And uh, but at the same time, they will maintain the same risk to a given market. So if they bought at 100 and uh, the market went to 120, they buy again, then they'll move the stop higher. So they so the stop loss on the new bigger position is still the same as it was uh, in, at the entry level of the position. And that is uh, key to remember that the stop losses on these longs have been moved higher as the price moved higher. And that basically means where... Well, they are closer to the market than they were initially, but the good thing is that the rally was, as you mentioned, 150 plus dollars, meaning that uh, these levels are stops are probably at this point in time relatively far away from uh, from the current spot market. So we can take quite a bit of uh, heat uh, without triggering some of these uh, these stops, which otherwise could trigger a, a cascade of of uh, sell orders, uh, even though there's not been any major change in the in the outlook. The title on page 11 is Too Much Too Soon with a question mark on it. It seems to me, you know, we had uh, the second hot inflation print in a row last week. That seems to have capped the rally. Now we're starting the correction. Uh, I just wonder how far the correction has. Uh, I, I think it is a buy the dip opportunity, probably. The question is, are we going all the way back down to, you know, 2100 or below? I, I guess the breakout zone was 2085, 2087, something like that. Uh, are we going all the way there on this correction or are we just uh you know going halfway there what do you think i would say i uh, hope not because uh, if we do take that 2080 80 80 90, 80, 90 area out then uh, i think we are into that territory where stops will start to uh, hit the market and again the uh, speculators hedge funds they do not ask questions they fire they shoot first if they're wrong they get out and then they take another look when the price uh, tells them to get back in again. So this a move potentially could have nothing to do with fundamentals, more simply positioning uh, being adjusted. So um, I think for now, I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on that uh, 2135 area. That was the previous uh, peak on the spot, on spot gold. I'd like to see it uh, hold that area. I uh, would get a little bit more nervous if we break below. But I think the what's also important and what we saw last week was uh, gold holding reasonably well through these, uh, these higher, hotter than expected inflation print. And I think part of that was silver, uh, picking up the baton uh, simply because of the rally we saw in copper, which for, for other reasons, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But silver last week was uh, silver's rally last week. I think helped cushion gold, uh, and, and the question is whether that can be maintained into into this week. So, um, so we're not a million miles away from from critical levels, but still have some some miles to go before, or some dollars to go before we start to get worried. On page twelve, you're showing twenty three hundred as an upside target. What's the time frame for that, and what do you see on the horizon even further out? I see that when we start to get the uh, the rate cuts, and um, and and those rate cuts has to be uh, at least the three that we have uh, priced in at this point in time. So um, when when we get and, and they just also just highlights one of the previous slides where we uh, and I'm sure both of you have seen the, seen that one before that the previous rate cut cycles in this uh, during the past twenty years have all led to uh, very strong rallies in gold. This time around, it's, the rally has started even before the cuts started to materialize, but that's uh, the market likes to run ahead of itself sometimes. But um, 2300 was, uh, I'll call it, the start of the year. The fact that if, if this rally that we've seen just recently managed to stick without the rate cuts and then adding the rate cuts on top of that to later in the year, uh, then potentially 2500, uh, which is the upper range of that potential long-term channel going all the way back to uh, 2007, uh, that could be the target. But uh, 2300 into the second half is my call. Let's move on to copper, which has moved uh, extraordinarily just in the last week or so. Uh, what is going on both long term and also what's been the driver short term for this uh, this big surge higher in copper prices? Well, f first of all, it's, it's a technical driven rally once again. The funds have been um, trading this from a short side for a while and uh, they've been forced to uh, get back into the market. But the, the fundamental trigger behind the rally is, is news out of China. 
China is the biggest refining refinery hub for refined metals in the world. And um, as we've seen producers, uh, mining companies around the world downgrade their production forecasts over the year, and uh, also with the Panama, uh, the copra mines surging down in Panama last year, that is starting to tighten the availability of supply of uh, copper. And that basically means all these smelters in China, they've been increasingly been faced with a few, uh, lower supply. And what you do in order to attract supply, well, you make it more cheap, cheaper to refine the copper in order to get supplies. So that uh, competition has been a race to the bottom. So uh, refining charges, um, treatment refinery charges in China is at one point almost a hit zero, which basically means they're not making money. They're most certainly losing money. And that's led to uh, to a decision last week that they will try to uh, curb production simply be, simply in order to lift the profitability. So, uh, and if they do that, the finished product of refined copper will uh, will 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 suffer uh, as well. So, so this is kind of a catch twenty two. Both basically, in in my mind, leading to to higher prices over time, and with these uh, supply cuts really starting to uh, be felt uh, into the uh, into the second half. Then I agree with uh, with that this is market that has been uh, asleep for a while simply because we had to deal with the uh, property crisis in in China. We've had to deal with the uh, sharply lower uh, growth expectations, uh, uh, sharply higher interest rates around the world, forcing uh, destocking of of mined uh, metals. And um, despite of all this, copper is now uh, starting to move move higher after this period of of consolidation, and uh, and I, I believe we are at the start of of a, a move that will continue to uh, to uh, to gain some some traction. Also, simply if if that momentum comes back to the market, then then there will be the uh, the added tailwind from from uh, funds starting having to get back into the market, having traded this uh, with a with a close to neutral position for for almost a year. Slide fourteen: energy transition metals. What's the story here? Just that it looks like we may be starting to see a few green shoots. If you look at uh, equity baskets and equity themes over the last year, boy, the uh, everything that's related to green transformation has been hammered. And some of these metals has, has suffered uh, significant losses as well. Just take a look at the, the chart here where we see that the, the year to date, the worst performing is the mining lithium miners. The, well, the best performing is uh, the actual lithium carbonate uh, contract or, or benchmark in China. So uh, it does indicate that miners are, are lacking right now a what looks like a, a start of a, a, a recovery in prices. And part of this is um, just like natural gas, driven by producers cutting back production simply because prices tanked by 80% over over the last year, back to where they more or less were before the massive spike we saw a couple of years ago. And uh, that has led to uh, to some uh, some production uh, curtailment, and, and that's starting to support the lithium price again. So lithium and copper, again, two key green metals that show signs of, of finding their feet here. So um, that's basically the main main story, I would say, from this one. Now, I notice you've got some comments on the right-hand side of page 14 about nuclear power, but you don't have uranium on the chart. Any thoughts on where uranium is headed? Uranium is heading higher, but um, for now, it's just like many other speculative, uh, or it has become a very speculative uh, market. We uh, we saw a, a rush of uh, new investors running into the rushing into the market, both, in, both into mining uh, companies, but also into ETFs, uh, tracking companies and ETFs tracking physical uranium to the extent that we probably uh, we overextended ourselves to the upside because we have to remember re- the uranium rally is, is a multi-decade rally. This is not happening overnight. Nuclear plants, plants are not built on a daily basis. We know more or less exactly what will be needed in, over, over time. Um, and that what will be needed over time is rising and that will underpin prices. But I think we, it was just simply so it was victim of a speculative bubble that drove uranium spot prices uh, to around $105 uh, a pound. Now we're back into the 80s, and uh, we've seen some of this uh, the speculative froth getting uh, getting out of the market. It was a typical buy rumor sell fact market. We rallied strong in January on expectation that both Kazakhstan and and Cameco in Canada would cut their production outlook. That materialized as expected, but the market had already taken that uh, had, had rallied quite substantially on the back of that. So, um, so right now it's just a question of of uh, I think we need to see if this market consolidates. Uh, I'm watching something like the Sprott uh, Physical Trust. The discount to uh, to NAV at one point last week hit fifteen percent. So you could basically buy the uh, the trust fifteen percent below uh, net asset value. 
that has since come down. But when you see these kind of spikes, that is obviously an indication that there is quite a lot of selling activity coming into the market from from uh, from people who want to get out. And, and everyone that got in in January was basically underwater, and that's led to this correction. But uh, the long term outlook, uh, I, be, I believe, is is very is very positive for uh, for the for the uranium for the commodity and and for the miners in general. I agree completely, and I did buy quite a bit at the 15% discount last week. 15, page 15 in crude oil. Yeah, crude oil. What can we say? We uh, It looks like we are starting to wake up a little bit. We have been struggling in a, in a relatively tight range for, for a long time. Just um, last week, early last week, the weekly average on a monthly rolling basis hit the lowest level in, in 10 years. So the market was really just uh, content with sitting here boxing around with Brent around the 80 and WTI a bit lower. But since then, the market has started to, to firm up a bit. And uh, of course, we all know the reasons for that. The main the main catalyst is still the, the tightness uh, of OPEC plus keeping barrels off the market. We've seen um, drone strikes hitting uh, re- plants in Russia, uh, lifting gasoline and diesel prices uh, simply because uh, Russia's uh, export of diesel and gasoline may be at risk. And uh, perhaps if it, worst case scenario, they have to import stuff. Um, so that's driving up the uh, the cost of refined products. That's underpinning crude oil. But also IEA last week came out saying, based on on the assumption that OPEC will keep supplies tight for the remainder of the year, they see now a, a deficit starting to emerge in the second half, a daily small deficits emerging, which will underpin prices. The upside is is still one I'm I'm a little bit doubtful about, simply because rallying higher prices with higher spare capacities rarely go hand in hand. And uh, what we have seen with the these production cuts from from OK, especially some of those in in the, in the Middle East where where taps can be turned on again relatively easy, the spare capacity has been rising to levels which which would normally not warrant a a, a spike in, in in prices. And at the same time, the Middle East situation remains. Uncertain, but at the same uh, at the same time, it just there's just a sense that almost no matter how bad it gets, there's not really any appetite for 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 this conflict to to start impacting uh, the the production and the the transportation of of uh, of crude for, away from the the main production areas. Saudi Arabia really got my attention when they announced recently that they're not intending, or actually they've reversed their prior decision to make further investments in their productive resources in Saudi Arabia. They're not going to increase beyond their current uh, production capacity, and they've made that announcement to the market. What do you make of that? Simply that they they don't see the need for it, but also at the same time, what's the point uh, spending billions of dollars uh, expanding your capacity if you may not need it anytime soon? And also just simply the, the fact that they are producing uh, quite a bit less than they, they, they can right now. So I think it's more a, just to uh, keep the uh, keep the, the money at the work somewhere else instead of trying to put, put them into investment that may not uh, necessarily pay off uh, any, anytime soon. And whether it's it's uh, whether it's a signal that we are we are approaching peak oil, I think that's probably uh, taking it a bit too far in terms of trying to analyze why that why they did. I think simply they they see there's no need for sp- spending all those uh, billions of dollars at this at this point in time, and that they can obviously revert that decision at any any moment in time if they feel that's uh, necessary or in in the years to come. Page 16, although one of the most valuable tools that we have in commodities trading is the government-supplied commitment of traders report. But the government's version of that report is so cryptic that it's really hard to follow. You provide a tremendous service where you kind of translate the government data into graphs and charts and very readable format. Uh, And you do that for free, uh, which is really a phenomenal service. Why do you do that and where can people find it? Well, first of all, I do it because I used to work for a hedge fund myself in in my days in London for nearly ten years. I know how they uh, operate, uh, at least some of them. Uh, how the the information that they have to provide to the authorities, how that is is useful for for everyone uh, who may not be buying and selling massive amounts of of uh, contracts uh, on, on a daily basis. And um, because what I what I what I say, with hedge funds are as I, as I put into this uh, little text there. They're quite often being accused of of uh, driving prices, uh, but they try to anticipate, but then also accelerate and amplify price changes that has been set in motion already. They are not the ones starting a move. They will join a move when when the momentum tells them this is the right thing to do. But at the same time, as also mentioned earlier, they are never married to their positions. Okay, unlike us, who potentially uh, is sometimes 
at risk with our with our investment uh, becoming married to the position when it starts to go wrong, believing that we're right over time and uh, the market is wrong. They don't have the luxury. They will respond if the price doesn't re- react uh, as they they were they were hoping for, as their position is, is is telling them. And that basically means as well they will be found holding the biggest long at the turn of the of, of a peak. Uh, when the market peaked, they'll also be found holding the biggest short at the bottom of the market. And that's why sometimes people call them dumb money. They are absolutely nothing, anything but dumb. They will be in these moves for as long as possible, uh, as long as momentum tells them to. So they, they will only get out when, when, they, when they have to. So I think otherwise they will obviously all be out of business if they were if it was dumb money. But it gives us mere mortals a good idea about what they're doing in terms of positioning. If the size starts to become very elevated, that does obviously raise the risk. Well, if something changes in the market, if the technical or fundamental outlook changes, combined with the the knowledge of the positions they they hold, then we uh, we, we can assume that something potential major could could happen and just look at gold right now as a, as i said the uh, the last two weeks uh, the last week it, it was a change with 2000 28500 lots that was added quite a substantial more than the previous week adding up to these 200 plus tons that i mentioned but that net now is now the highest uh, we've seen in, in a couple of years obviously leaving it exposed if we do see a change in the in the price action so that's why we're watching that we're watching all these uh, reds in the, in the grains as i mentioned the shorts across the board um, into the into the spring, and then uh, also interestingly, the something like the the cocoa, as I mentioned, where the the cocoa short uh, long is, is 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 much reduced compared to where it was just uh, just a few months ago. So it's basically a radar, knowing what they what they hold, and then combine that with the uh, with the market activity, and that gives you a good idea about when uh, when things potentially potentially could start to get a bit bit risky. Well, Ola, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview, as always. One final question before we go, though. I mean, everybody knows the big theme this year has been inflation. You guys at Saxo Bank have actually gotten some attention for slashing your fees on your online trading platform. Uh, you go in opposite the direction. I'm sure that's appreciated by a lot of traders. What's the motivation for that? And uh, also, be sure to tell us where our listeners can find your uh, research on the Commitment of Traders reports that you just described. Well, thank you, Eric. Well, it, first and foremost, uh, just just we wanted to be uh, we want to be competitive. Who who doesn't? But at the same time, also just just the knowledge of of how how trading commissions uh, erodes your return over time. So uh, our business is built on long term relationship. We obviously like to have clients uh, staying with us and growing with us, and uh, and and a way to do that is also to to ensure that when they, when they do enter the market, that they enter the market at, at decent levels in terms of, of cost. So uh, so that was introduced back in rollingly being introduced across the world. Uh, we started with the with that process back in, in January. But otherwise, Eric, you can obviously always um, find me on, on uh, Twitter. I put in the, the handle there. You, I don't talk about recipes and dogs and cats. It's really only commodities most of the time, uh, almost uh, I would say 99% of the time. Perhaps sometimes a picture from uh, the seas around Copenhagen, which uh, is, is cold this time of year, but beautiful to swim in during the summer. And then also, if you uh, into our our website analysis.saxo, where I've got great content from uh, from all my colleagues uh, around the world, focusing on the different asset classes. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was a great interview with Oli. Now joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Ole Hansen's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil starting with the EIA inventory. EIA printed a drawdown of 2 million barrels of crude oil, Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down a de minimis 18,000 barrels. Gasoline, drawing down 3.3 million barrels. Distillates, building 624,000 barrels for a net petroleum drawdown of 4.6 million barrels. U.S. production held steady at 13.1 million barrels, unchanged from last week. 
We've got a clear breakout above $80. That was the round number resistance we were fighting with for the last few weeks. That suggests further upside to come. But echoing what Ola said, I can't get too excited in an environment of increasing spare capacity for this rally to go too much farther. So I don't think we're headed back towards $100 prices anytime soon, unless there's a geopolitical escalation. And of course, anything is possible on that front. Well, Eric, it was a very clean breakout on crude oil, and uh, it remains well above its 50-day moving average. The pattern of higher highs and higher lows continues. And I get the whole idea of spare capacity and a lot of the reasons why a lot of people are uh, relatively skeptical about the sustainability of this rally. But the one thing I reflect on is, is that the substantial volatility, both to the upside and downside, is an inherent feature. And right now, the sentiment, not very many people are buying into this oil rally. For me, it still wouldn't be a shocker if the oil market made a couple pushes higher. Like even though all of you will end up being right that that spare capacity kept oil trade ranged, it doesn't mean we can't print 90 before going back to 75 and the average price for the year ends up in the uh, the low 80s. And so um, here, the trend is still in your favor. And if all dips end up being bought in the $79, $80 area that keep it above the 50-day moving average, I'm still in the camp that there could be a few more bullish impulses on the upside of crude. So let's move on to equities. Eric, uh, what's your thinking here? Well, the FOMC statement and Jay Powell's dovish comments in the presser propelled stocks higher. As I've said before, I see this as a melt-up that doesn't make a lot of fundamental sense, but it shows all the signs of continuing higher. All right. Well, I want to get Nick involved in this conversation. Uh, Nick, uh, on uh, page three, we have the S&P 500 index with your levels. So uh, what are you thinking here, bud? Spot price right now on SPX is approximately 52.50. We have a call wall above at 52.50 and a put wall below at 5,100. Now, the implied move for the April 19th monthly OPEX is plus minus 130 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 53.50 and the lower implied move is 5090. Right now, we have key resistance above at 5250, all time highs, and key support below at 5100. I'm inclined to think we see a pop now toward that 5300 mark as we get a blow off top in the market, given Powell's commentary. And right now, we have the next FOMC meeting coming April 30th and May 1st. So that's probably the next volatility inducing event we're going to see. But until then, I'm kind of bullish short term. On page four, I have that S&P 500 uh, futures chart on the continuous with that 50-day moving average. And the one thing we've seen relentlessly since the start of the year, literally started in January, was this pattern of higher highs and higher lows in this crawl higher. And every single dip gets bought pretty much systematically at the exact same time. You know, a quick little retrace, uh, multiple days, and then pops higher. We're already slowly approaching some of the short term swing high targets, which, uh, you know, would be expected to have a similar pattern, which is it pauses, retraces, and then advances again. It clearly is that the primary trend is up. The bulls are in control, higher highs, higher lows. Price action is bullish that way. But this is an incredibly overextended market. And really, at some point, all it will take is one surprise catalyst. And quickly, everyone that is rushing to buy uh, simply because they feel that uh, this primary primary trend is in control, uh, will quickly uh, start to try to flatten their positioning. What will that trigger be? I don't know. But right now, the bulls are in control. On the S&P futures, I'm looking for about 53.50, which is about 40 more S&P points higher. And uh, we'll we'll see uh, whether or not the market consolidates there. And moving on to the NASDAQ chart here, Nick, what levels are you watching? Spot price on Qs right now is approximately 446. We have a call wall above at 450 all-time highs and a put wall below at 435. The implied move for the April 19th monthly OPEX is plus minus 16 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is fresh all-time highs at 462 and the lower implied move is at 430. Right now, we have key resistance at all-time highs at 450 and key support at 430. 
As I mentioned on the S&P, I'm bullish short term. Longer term, I'm more cautious, uh, especially on tech names. I mentioned last week that Google and Apple were longer term buys as they were hitting their lows. And Google had a nice bounce on Monday with that news that they're going to possibly be licensing their Gemini software to Apple. Uh, Apple also popped at that news as well. But I'm short term bullish on certain names. I'm being very selective here. I'm not, you know, broad market saying I'm, I'm bullish overall. You got to be very, very selective as we hit these new highs. All right. Well, looking on page six here, Nick, we have the volatility index and here we are at the 12 handle. I mean, at this stage, uh, the bull continues. There was a little bit of volatility premium priced in for uh, just in case the the Fed meeting became a pivot. But clearly now in the post Fed period, uh, we're coming right back down to the year lows. Uh, what, what are the uh, VIX levels telling you? Yeah, so with the VIX at approximately 13, we can expect intraday top to bottom moves of approximately 0.75%. And right now what we're seeing with the VIX near lows is very, very cheap insurance on longer term time horizons. That being out of the money puts in the event of some exogenous event occurring, causing market volatility to increase suddenly. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the next FOMC meeting is April 30th and May 1st. So that might be the next volatility inducing event. But right now, given that we're in this swing to the upside with the bulls in control, it's hard to really say that buying puts in the short term would make a lot of sense. I do think that volatility will decline into that FOMC event thereafter, as anyone's guess. Now, moving on to page seven, we have the US dollar index. What are you guys thinking here? The FOMC statement seemed at first to suggest that the Fed didn't think inflation is done, just as Jim Bianco told us recently here on Macro Voices. And the dot plot seemed to indicate that further hiking was on deck in 2025 and beyond, but not until they first made sure they got those three rate cuts in between now and the election, which of course is not at all politically motivated in any way. Then Jay's speech crushed those hawkish interpretations when he insisted that the dots don't represent a plan or strategy. I think Jim Bianco has it exactly right. Inflation has probably bottomed, and the fantasy of many traders that we were about to begin a rate-cutting cycle that would take us all the way back down to 2% or 0% treasury rates or whatever they thought was going to happen. No, I don't think so. I think we're going to get a few rate cuts in 2024, which seem to me to be politically motivated, and then the data seems to suggest that we may go back to a hiking cycle after that. Now, if Jim Bianco is right on the timing, that means May or June for the first cut. My view is that the dollar hasn't revealed its hand yet. Uh, the 104 was a very key level for the dollar to beat. And as it approached it, it stalled out there and it certainly paused there in the post FOMC. But at the same time, all pullbacks in the dollar have actually been very well contained and bold. And on top of that, you have the US dollar yen uh, about to break to a fresh high. And so the dollar index itself is in the dead center of its one year trade range. And it really hasn't shown its hand. At some point, the dollar will signal some sort of intermarket move and a lot of risk assets will reflect. But right now, the dollar is somewhat trendless and FOMC was not the trigger for a big currency move. And so we'll wait to see whether or not some sort of more meaningful move happens here. Uh, right now, uh, just respecting the trade range is the, all that we can really do. Now on page eight, we have that gold futures chart with gold breaking to new all-time highs. Eric, what are your thoughts here? Well, I was expecting and hoping for a deeper correction in gold so that I could uh, put some more size on my long position. But of course, as soon as Jay Powell crushed those expectations that were set by the dot plot, uh, we were at new all-time highs by Wednesday's close. So the correction is probably over and 2300 is likely the next near-term upside target, just as Ola Hansen said in this week's feature interview. The longer-term cup and handle pattern still has targets around 27 25, but that could take a year or more to play out. And given the dot plot, I'll be taking profits on my gold longs around election time later this year. Eric, the 2300 number that you uh, suggested as a near-term target has been a number I've been watching closely as well. And um, I uh, am in the camp where on the very short term, gold is in an uptrend, making higher highs, pushing trend, taking flows. Uh, no reason why something like 2300 couldn't be achieved. In the bigger picture, though, the real 
big gold bull market uh, is likely to be occurring during an easing cycle, during a period where the dollar is generally weak in some sort of a downtrend. We haven't seen those bigger picture conditions really start yet. So uh, after gold finishes this move, it would be very natural for it to backfill and retrace. Overall, gold's been very bullish, all-time new highs, holding up along there. There's no reason not to believe gold will stay up there. The bigger question, is this the beginning of this extraordinary move that will hit 2700 or 3000 on the upside? And while I think over time, those upper targets are 100% in play, the question is, is this breakout we just saw here in March that beginning of that move and that uh the jury's still out on that i, I agree with you on the 2300 we definitely have room to go a little bit higher on the short term but it'll all be about the way it consolidates here into the summer that will uh be the big tell for me now to finish up guys we have this chart on uranium what are your thoughts I was hoping for another leg down before the correction ended, but it's starting to look like the bottom is probably already in, although it's early to say that with conviction. The deep value play here, if you don't mind some geopolitical risk, is in Global Atomic, a ticker symbol GLO. Now, the backstory here is Niger, and if you're not sure what I'm talking about, the uh, West African country that's uranium-rich and looks to English speakers like it ought to be pronounced Niger. Well, that's a French-speaking place, so it's pronounced Niger. And uh, their situation, they had a coup, essentially. They have a military junta, which is in control. They were accused by the United States of maybe uh, getting ready to sell uranium to Iran, and they didn't take very well to that. I think the United States felt like uh, they were going to test their metal or something, and the reaction of the military in Niger was basically, get out of our country. You're not welcome here. And the U.S. is now backpedaling and saying, well, but wait a minute. Um, we, we were going to build a couple of very strategic bases here. You have to let us stay. Uh, what do you think you are, a sovereign country that gets to make up your own rules? We're the United States. Uh, so I don't know where this is headed. I don't perceive that there's really any great risk to, you know, nationalization of uranium assets or anything like that. I suppose there is maybe a risk that the United States gets into a spat with the current regime. I think it's more likely that they're going to work this out. But one way or another, I thought that Global Atomic was a screaming buy when it was north of $3. Uh, our friend Justin Hewn over at UraniumInsider.com thought the same thing. He thought it was a buy around $3. And we ended up touching almost down to $2 in this reaction to the news in Niger. There is clearly geopolitical risk here. Of course, there's always the possibility that this stock goes to zero if you had, I don't know, a nationalization or some really crazy kind of event. I don't think the political cards, as I'm reading them, are setting up for that kind of event. I think the U.S. is going to have to swallow a little bit of crow and eat their words, and they'll get to build their military base. And uh, this is probably a deep value you play. Everything else is off its bottoms, whereas uh, Global Atomic is the only thing that's trading right on its cycle lows as we speak. Eric, whether there was one more dip or not, and you got a chance to buy it a few dollars better, uh, I think the consensus was uh, on the show that this is a buy on dip. I don't see any reason why it's not. Ultimately, uranium had a great run. It was a nine-month advance that uh, saw an extraordinary 100-plus advance. Those rallies get checked, and after primary trend moves like that, these secondary corrections wash out weak hands, people that were chasing performance, people that weren't uh, there for the high conviction, and or simply trend followers that uh, got signals that the short-term trend was over. Ultimately, this is now retraced close to uh, half of its gain. And after that kind of a correction is typically when buy-on-dip traders start to emerge. And so you can see on the chart that we're approaching the 50-day moving average. This would be a level where, uh, if broken, and especially if we can get above $30 on this chart, that it may signal that uh, we are re-resuming some sort of new bull trend. Have we beat the 50-day? No. Have we beat that $30 level? No. So there's a lot of things that still have to happen, but this correction has been already a month plus. It's already gone deep enough. So watching whether or not uranium starts to bull here is certainly on my mind. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. 
Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. In this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find a transcript for today's interview, as well as a slide deck provided by Ole Hansen, and the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, including a link to a number of articles that we found really interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>